so if you have already the account table from your analysis pipeline and you want to figure out how to do your DEG isolation using the Lima Vun pipeline, well, this is the video for you. So to run this analysis, you need a few things. First of all, you need R and R Studio installed, obviously. Uh, you can download the exact script that I'm using later in the GitHub page. Uh, in the video description down below and I'll also link the original uh, tutorial that I'm using in the video description down below as well just to get more information. Uh, next one maybe some snacks and green in case it's going to take a long time. So just remember that this analysis is based on the input using the count table and we're going to generate a list of DEG from the count table that you have fit it in. So in the Lima Wound analysis, there'll be five main steps that you need to take note later. So the first one is the creation of a DGE list, which will create a DGE object. And then we're gonna create a model matrix of your experimental design. And we're gonna fit them into a wound transformation. We actually fit the linear model suitable for RNA sequencing analysis. And then we're gonna run a linear model fit and then we're gonna again run make contrast and contrast feed to isolate out the DEG. So once we get it settled, let's actually move on to our R Studio. Okay, let's start. So once you open up the script in R Studio, just make sure you have both HR and Lima installed. Uh, remember that you have to install these two through the bioconductor, which I'm gonna link you right down there, maybe in the video description on where to install and how to install. So once you got it done, there's two things you need to take note. First one that we have talked about the five main steps in the Lima pipeline, but this video is going to separate into three main chapters, but chapter one will be the data import and understanding of the data they're importing. Uh, the second will be data normalization, making comparison and running like wound transformation. And the third one will be the DEG isolation from the group that you have just designed in chapter one, so that you will be able to make contrast and contrast fit the thing to get your isolated DG. Okay, so the first chunk is always kind of a, for me, it's kind of a, a aesthetic for the RMD, as well as the original training script right here from UC Davis in 27, 2018. So please do go, go in and try to actually read about it because there's a lot more information inside the original script that I cannot include here, otherwise the video will be two hours long. Okay, so let's move into chapter one, data import and understanding of the data. So the first one is actually just to read in the original count table. So in this case, I'm not gonna change anything because we're gonna load in 24 individual samples and we're gonna load in about 30,000 gene if I'm not wrong over here. So you can see that there's 34,000 gene in 24 samples, okay? And the count table, of course, because it's RNA sequencing, everything is an integer. So once we've done that, we're gonna do a construct we're gonna do a construction of a DEG object using the DEG list command. And we're gonna calculate the norm factor just to cross-correct the different library size. For example, if you have one with 10 million, one with 100 million, a 10 count in both is not gonna be the same. So the normalization factor is gonna set that out. And the second one is actually try to filter based on the low count rate. So in this case, we're gonna filter based on the CPM, which is counts per million. So if a gene is expressed less than once per million count, we're gonna cut it out because we consider them too low and we don't wanna include them in our analysis. Uh, because there are usually too much variability when the count rate is very low and we don't want any false positive. So after the filtering done, we have gone from 34,000 to 21,000, which of course significantly increased the speed of the analysis and stuff like that and you know reduce the false positive that you have. So the next one is actually very, very, what I would call very uh, specific to the sample that you're dealing with. So remember just now I talked about we are importing 24 different samples. So in this experimental specifically, there is four different groups. Uh, so the four different groups are C6, I5, 6, I8, 6, C9, I5, 9, I8, 9. So what that actually means is uh, C is the control and 6 and 9 is the time. Nice. So C6 means control cultivar on time 6. C9, control cultivar on time 9, and I5, 6, and I5, 9, obviously, is the different cultivar at the time 6 and time 9, and I8 and 6 and 9, similarly, is I8 cultivar on time 6 and I8 cultivar in time 9, so on and so forth. So once we got that uh, set out, we have to actually individually we have to plot 24 of them just to indicate the column that we have for our count table here. 
uh, what are the uh, identity and which group they don't belong in and you just do it um, just 24 different as a list so 24 individual groups in a list and that will tell the system what it is so once we've done that we're going to do an MDS plot so MDS actually stands for multi-dimensional scaling plot so what it does is actually just uh, count the individual difference in expression between each gene and each sample and actually plot it out how different are the two samples away from each other so in this case the color actually indicates the group that we just assigned so you can see that c9 over there is up here c6 is right here and i5 i8 is here so it's funny that the i5 and i8 6 and the c6 are very very similar but where when they're on time 9 then the cultivar and the control can actually separate out so if you're doing cultivar 6 here maybe you won't get much result but on time 9 maybe the result will be a lot better when you're doing dg analysis so mds is supposed to tell you that so since i don't believe it i also run something like a pca which is principal component analysis uh, a very general tool used to separate out what i call uh, multi-dimensional data but because PCA almost always assume a linear relationship and without any doing without doing any kind of transformation uh, the result is not as good as the MDS scaling so remember that the count rate for the gene is not this it's not a linear linear relationship with the the count rate and the number of count so that's different it, it's actually a negative binomial uh, so I'm actually researching on a video on negative binomial in Lima and HR and DSEC2. Why do they use that? So remember to say subscribe so you don't miss that video. It's actually been a few months in making that. So let's move on to chapter 2 once we figure out how we're going to make our comparison. So chapter 2 is about data normalization and making the models. So we're going to make our model first. So how do we do that is through the model matrix function over there. So how it does is that remember the groups uh, ident the groups uh, object that we created just now right here. So can you see there's 24 of them with four different levels. So just fit that directly into the model matrix. And we're going to do a zero plus group. And what is that? Zero actually indicates that the intercept of it is zero. Uh, what it actually does is uh, it's, it doesn't matter if you don't have an intercept when you're doing a factor, uh, factor level between the groups. But if you're doing something like a continuous data, you might not want to put zero here. Uh, it, it's a lot more clear in the original um, tutorial there, but it's quite complicated in terms of what it does. So after I've set up the matrix, I also do the p-heat map to indicate for the 24 samples that we have, which group do that belongs in, it's because we need to cross compare them later, just to make sure I don't miss out anything, there's no errors, and I know exactly cultivar 1, 2, 3, 4 is here, 4, 5, 6, 5, 6, 7 is here, and so on and so forth, okay? Uh, it's the same thing, I just visualize it so that it's, make, it's easier for me to understand. So the next one is actually transform the original data. So D actually means the DGE object, uh, the filtered DGE object. So it should, it should assume something like a, a J pattern that you'll see right here. So if it's not on the J pattern, if it's a straight line or normal distribution or some sort of other weird curve, you might want to look at, first of all, your sequencing data. Do you filter it clearly? Uh, how about your SAM2 and all the other stuff? When you generate the count table, have you generated it correctly or not? So if it's something, if it looks somewhat like that, then usually you are safe. So you can move on to the next step of the analysis. So once we've done that, since we already run a VOOM transformation, we're going to fit our data into a linear model. So in this case, we're going to run an LM fit uh, and we're going to include both our VOOM model as well as our model matrix and we can have a look at our coefficients. So how do you understand coefficient for me is kind of like the average expression uh, between all the biological replicates. Remember, we have four biological replicates per groups. So you average out the four and then apply a lot to transformation and some correction factor and normalization factor so that the higher the number over here means the higher the expression level. So you can see that 5.3 is much larger than 0 0.9 and so on. So remember it's in a log scale so that uh, one higher doesn't actually means one more count rate. It actually means twofold increase. So once we've done that, we have our fit object. 
it is time to move on to our chapter 3. So in chapter 3, we're trying to establish the sample group for the DG analysis. And how do you establish a sample group is to actually use the make contrast function over there. So chunk number 1 actually just show you an example of how it's used. So in, in this case, if you want to make three comparison B to A, C to B, and C to A, what you do is you just do it like that, B minus A, and then you actually make a contrast matrix of B minus A, something like that. So what that means is actually a frames of reference thing. So when you compare B to A, when a gene is highly expressed, a log two fold change of a positive value uh, means it's highly, it's highly expressed in B and lowly expressed in A, and so on and so forth. You, you'll see later in the coefficient. So uh, in this case, there's three different contrasts that you want to do, but for people that run it for the first time, most likely because you're running, you're watching this video, uh, just make one first, and then we can actually run the different kind of analysis later on. I'll show you how. So how to do it is instead of using ABC like just now, you just put in your group name with the level of all the sample name over there. So in this case, you can see that we're comparing group I5-9 to I5-6. And then uh, anything that's highly expressed in 9 is going to show up as positive and lower express is going to show up as negative and so on. Okay, so we're going to pipe the object into something called a con, con R object. And once we got a con R object, we're going to run it into our contrast feed using the original feed object that we run just now over here. Okay, so we're going to run a contrast feed on the feed and a con R object. And we're going to run through something called the eBase, which is the empirical base statistic for differential expression. So uh, think of it as multiple testing errors. So it removes the false positive from your analysis to ensure that you don't end up with too many false results. Okay, so next one, we're going to use something like a top table to actually extract out the p-value. In this case, that extract out, sorry, not the p-value, we're going to extract out all the DEG, but we're going to sort by the p-value. Okay, so that's why we have, you can see that for the top five result that we see there, the p-value ranges from negative 16 to negative 10, from smaller to bigger. So obviously I don't trust directly on the, full, the, on the log two fold change over here. So what I'm gonna do is compare the log two fold change to the coefficient that we have isolated earlier, as you can see right here on the feed object. So once I do that, you realize that, uh, what I'm gonna, so how I do that is I actually use uh, contain using the row names, which is actually the gene name over here. So what I discovered that you do, uh, for example, 32720 uh, is a log two fold change of three. So obviously it is up regulated in I59 and down regulated in I56 on a factor of around three, right? Because remember uh, coefficient is in the log scale. So you can see that in 230 over there is minus six because it's one versus seven. So it's a much lower in I59, much higher in I56. That's why the log two fold change is gonna be a negative six. So it's, it looks as if it's a simple minus of each other, but trust me, they've done enough mathematics to know what they're doing with. So uh, the log two fold change can be actually isolated from that. So obviously you are kind of done, but just just for um, just to make it easier to understand, we're gonna again uh, just filter out based on adjust p value of less than zero point zero five, so that you don't you you don't get so many things when you write it down. So we get about four thousand six hundred um, different deg based on a filtered adjusted p-value of 0.05 and we're going to create a new object called DEGs and you can actually see right here on our DEG list and our log to full change. So again, it's an object in R, it's kind of difficult to communicate. So what I'm going to do is again, just write it as into a CSV file and you will have this time 5 versus time 6 i5 txt, which of course you can include into your presentation, your thesis or any kind of paper that you publish very easily. So uh, I did say just now that we try to do grouping one by one when we started. So how we're going to do that is basically this whole chunk over there. What you're going to do is change the grouping here. So remember just now we are comparing group I5 to group I5-6, sorry, I5-6 to I5-9. I5, so what we're going to do is compare, compare I5-6 to C6, which is the control 6, and everything else remain exactly the same. So again, you can just run the whole thing and you will actually give you another TXT file and also give you another table of different full change. Uh, I did not include the coefficient here because they're not usually part of the output that you need to report. 
but rather it's more about understanding of the whole set. So that's basically it, but just to make things a little bit more interesting visually because I'm making a YouTube video, uh, I actually just run a top table, run a filter, and run a ggplot on the top, uh, uh, a top 20, I believe. Yeah, a, a top um, DEGs onto a, a scatter plot in this case and try to human geon text and to, to fill in the, the plot. So in this case, you can see that I use log twofold change as the y axis and adjust the p value as the x axis. So you can see these are all the, the DEG that you have in relation to the log twofold change, sorry, the log fold change and adjusted p value. So you can actually have a look at everything up here is up regulated, everything down here is down regulated, everything on the left is more significant, everything on the right is less significant, but still significant enough that you should consider it for your downstream analysis. For example, function enrichment or goal analysis, which you can again understand more with this bubble right somewhere. So that's basically the whole thing about the Lima Vun analysis starting from the count table. I hope you learned something today and do, do leave a question on what else should I do? I'm running out of ideas, seriously. So, yeah, that's it. Bye.